Well, hello everyone, and thanks to the back after the good lunch, I hope you had. Um, yeah, so I will um, be talking today about the uh, measurements um, that we have been doing uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, and um, the measurements have been uh, associated with the, the year of polar prediction enhanced observations, but we are actually using a lot of other uh, observations as well. And I would like to um, acknowledge, uh, well, you, you can see a lot of co-authors actually, and um, I'd like to acknowledge that this, is, this has been a teamwork, and uh, some people are involved only in measurements, some in the like modeling contribution, and actually this is what, uh, for me, the YOP has been about. So it's really, they have been, have been working a lot together and learning a lot from, from each other. So the topic of my presentation is atmospheric rivers bringing heat and rain to the Antarctic Peninsula, so from the YOP enhanced observations. And this is the rain and heat. So rain, I would like to uh, make an emphasis that, as we know, typically it snows in Antarctica, but I would like to really make a, a point that we have actually a lot of rain as well. So why we, are, uh, why we care? So just a brief introduction. So what's happening, we have uh, two ice sheets and red means they're losing mass. So here in Greenland, it's really clear. We have, uh, it's losing mass all over the, the coastal uh, regions, while in Antarctica you can see that it's a lot more heterogeneous. And um, if you're looking closer in Antarctica, so we have this heterogeneity and we have only some specific regions and it's really strong mass loss actually in the, in the West Antarctica and around the Antarctic Peninsula and in the Weddell Sea and the Felicia Ron ice shelf. And we have also some patches here, but other areas, they actually, they gain mass. And this heterogeneity is really difficult for, um, for the models and the processes behind this, uh, this, um, this surface mass balance and uh, snowfall to represent. And here, it's again a reminder what's happening in Antarctica. So that's the division west, east, uh, peninsula, and the whole Antarctica. So this goes down. You see, this is the, um, the dynamic mass loss. And we have in blue, so this is the mass gain, so this is the surface mass balance. And we see that it's actually, it's um, losing some mass, but it's actually gaining. And here it's, it's again, you see the, the huge, not only heterogeneity over space, but also huge interannual variability. And overall, we see that there is an increase in surface mass balance over the peninsula, but overall that's the dynamic uh, loss. It's, it's um, actually overcoming this, um, this gain. So lots of questions and lots of questions how to actually uh, model this correctly and that we still miss observations. And here I would like to highlight, because I have been um, the, one of the lead authors of the recent IPCC report, and that's the figure that we put together, which was not actually easy to decide what we want to, sh to, to, to share well, with everybody because, well, lots of changes and we could make only one figure. So here we put, uh, so this is the actually showing the changes in temperature, and these are based on observations. So we see that Antarctic Peninsula has been warming, and it's really, it's, uh, we have this Antarctic amplification only showing up in the, in the peninsula region as much, well, in the Arctic, we have it all, all over. But if you look at the surface mass balance and the differences, this is from observations, but this is from regional climate models, because we actually we don't have enough observations to have the same reconstruction all over Antarctica. So and we see again, no trend. So we have huge internal variability and the models show no trend. And just one more slide for the introduction. Why do we care? So if you look at the observations actually, the ice cores, just without going into details, there is a trend. So this is really going like, if you look at the, the last uh, 70 years, there is a really increase. So observations actually show an increase in surface mass balance. So there is a huge mismatch, what we are trying to understand. And another thing is important is that we have extreme, so extreme precipitation events. That was a paper by Turner et al. showing that this is really important around Antarctica as contribution to surface mass balance, but we have also rainfall. So that's the recent paper that's showing that all around the, the coastal areas and especially over the peninsula, so this is based on observations, so this is on the Sinop observations, just the occurrence of rainfall, so that was actually the first paper that Etienne was leading, that's uh, showing that this is really an important uh, component and an important factor to, to understand. So why atmospheric rivers? So all I have uh, shown the introduction to you is that uh, we actually, atmospheric rivers really play in a huge role in uh, both in the extreme uh, snowfall events, in rain, and in change in temperature. So what are the atmospheric rivers? There are long corridors of intense moisture transport. They are associated typically with extratropical cyclones. It can be one or a series of cyclones. 
So they transport moisture and heat from lower latitudes polewards, and they can lead to extreme precipitation and also major surface melt. So there is, again, these two factors that they are important uh, for. So if you remember the map of the importance of extreme precipitation for the total surface mass balance, so this map actually summarizes the uh, role of atmospheric rivers in extreme uh, precipitation. So if you take the 95th or 99th percentile, so you see here it's like up to 30% and sometimes 40% of the 95th percentile of precipitation events is explained by atmospheric rivers. And then if you go to the most extreme, it's actually 60 and above along here, escarpment region and along the, the coast that are explained by atmospheric rivers. So this is again really important uh, to understand the processes behind. And again, that was precipitation. If we switch to the surface melt, this is the, uh, again, we have the summer and, and winter here. So in summer, we see that uh, color. So the more, like the, the darker red means the higher percentage of the major melt events that are explained by atmospheric rivers. So here in summer, we see that only some parts uh, are actually explained by atmospheric rivers. But in winter, there is less melt, but there is also um, more of, of this uh, major melt events are explained by atmospheric rivers. So that was the, well, to give you an introduction and the, the uh, answers maybe to some questions why we actually have to measure atmospheric rivers because this is not easy to do and it's actually there have been under measured because it's not easy to do. So that's what we have been doing. So there were two uh, spe special observing periods. So first was in summer from November 2018 to March 2019. And uh, it's actually the measurements were done by my colleagues. So there is uh, San John Park and uh, Penny Row and Heike Kalesa. So they were um, doing the measurements uh, part of their project during that time. And I was doing the forecast of atmospheric rivers and it was really worked out super well. And actually that was uh, the project one in Punta Arenas and one in, uh, on King George Island. And uh, another um, uh, major of special observing period that is just uh, finished uh, yesterday. So that's the winter from April, mid-April to, to uh, 30th of August uh, this year. So that was um, another approach. So while during the, the uh, summer, that was the radio sounds during the entire special observing period, there was enhanced radio sound measurements and there were no um, specific uh, events chosen, but in winter, it's really, uh, it was not possible for most stations to do regular observations during the entire several months in winter. And they, uh, so we, we put together forecast teams and I was leading the, the team over the Antarctic Peninsula and, and David was leading the team of the East Antarctica. And it was the whole teamwork. There was many, there was more than 15 countries involved. So we were all taking decisions together which events we would like to measure. And most of the events we measured were atmospheric rivers. However, today I will not present because that's just uh, over. So we have to analyze this data, but I will present you another event so that you will see. Uh, so how can I play the video? Just th that was, yeah, this is a video, hopefully it will pay, just to, to show all this, the, the, uh, um, the launch that we're doing this summer in uh, February. So it's not always goes that predicted. So it was, well, as you see also, that's at Escudero Station. Lots of uh, um, structures, very, or how can I go to the next slide? Lots of structures, and this is the, the example in, oh, sorry, in winter. So that is from Sayova Station, again, during a really strong um, event. So you see also there is different uh, setup, right? So it's like it depends which station you're doing the forecast and actually when, in, in winter or in summer. So then, yeah, it's, it's again the same question that uh, was posed uh, today uh, this, the, during the plenary session this morning. So why, why do you want to do this? Like it's not really, maybe that's much fun. Well, it can be. So I, this is what we tried to put together using the observations from the summer special observing period. So that was from Johnny Moundland actually, and this is not Antarctic Peninsula, but we used observations from Neumeyer and uh, Sayova Station to show actually, so why we, we care about this uh, extra uh, radio sounds. So here, just um, uh, in a, like quickly to show, this is the median over the 10 year period from 2009, 2019. So this is, the, uh, this is all based on, on uh, observations. 
uh, the, the solid lines, and then this is era five, this is era interim, and this is median based on observations. So you see, so this is the median of all profiles, and it's summer and winter, and this is the uh, composite for atmospheric rivers. So all the colors, this is atmospheric rivers. So first thing that you see is it's really the extreme state of the entire lower troposphere during the atmospheric rivers, which stands out like really drastically from the median. Right, so this is the uh, this is why because we really have to understand what's happening with these extreme events. Another important thing is that you see that what's happening with the temperature in this uh, famous near surface layer. So this is all events, so the, and this again, this is a composite from 10-year observations, including this the, the new special observing period. But this is their really rare observations, first of all, also because usually we, well we also have a failure during these events. So there are not so many, but the temperature goes to zero. So this is what's happening during this event. So it's heat and moisture, right? So we have not only increasing specific humidity and increasing, so we have this low level jet, which really stands out in these observations and that controls the, this maximum in the moisture flux, but we have this uh, crossing of zero uh, temperature. So the two events that are really, um, well, we have been looking at, um, so I just, I made a, a quick uh, overview here, but I uh, will be focusing actually only on this event. So here we um, actually, we have already published and there will be other papers coming out because of, uh, about this December 2018 event. So there was a one day event, it was the uh, impacting up inside of the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula and it was hitting really with westerly wind. So really different the other events. That was in 7th February 2022. So we see it was lasting three days, and it was affecting the entire Antarctic Peninsula region, including coastal pine island and glacier and thrown ice shelf. And then there is uh, it was hitting really this meridional uh, strong meridional flux. So and what was happening? So there was a temperature increase during the first period, but the scale is not the same here. So it was increasing from minus one to five degrees, while during the February event it was really record high temperatures. So we are, uh, so this is from 1st to 11th of February. So we see the temperature, well, and this is actually comparing to era five um, range, so maximum, minimum, and the median, uh, the mean, sorry. And then we see that this is green. So this is observations at Vernadsky station, how fast it was the night of the 7th of February that the temperature increased up to, um, it was 13 degrees Celsius, and that was really record high. Oops, okay. Uh, I have to speed up. Uh, so that's, well, the methodology. So we are using the observations and era 5 analysis and also polar wharf high resolution modeling. And the first event, so that's the just one uh, thing I will highlight that it's really, there was a transition from uh, snowfall. So here we see that the, this is from the measurements, this is from the model. The temperature goes up, we have the, the rainfall here, and then we have the snowfall rainfall transition. While at Vernadsky station also we had the rainfall just in between of the snowfall event. But I really have to be fast now if I can take a well, couple minutes. So this is the, um, the IVT, so integrated vapor transport together with the um, mean sea level pressure. And this is the uh, contour of the atmospheric rivers. So we see how strictly meridional it gets like when it, it's hitting peninsula and it's actually impacting the entire Antarctic peninsula. And now I'm talking about this record uh, high temperature event in February. And uh, so we're applying this new scale that was available from uh, Scripps Group, and they also extended the scale to, to Antarctica that was experimental during YOP. And we see that it was the AR scale five, and the scale depends also on the duration and the intensity of the IVT specific point. So this is a really, it's like relevant to the, the hurricane scales. And we see this AR scale five over the, the coast of Chile, it's actually hit the Antarctic Peninsula as AR scale three. So that was really important uh, impact. So it was not only the moisture that uh, matters, so if you look at the, the thickness between so, uh, 1,500 hectopascal, so it was really this uh, strong heating of the, the tropospheric layer that was uh, over the Antarctic Peninsula. And we see, so this is the, the speed of the, uh, um, the upper level jet of the jet stream, so we see that it was really, there is a stagnation, so there was a stationary wave actually impacting the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, and at the same time, so, and what we also could confirm with observations, which I will not show here, that there was this, um, the medium to deep uh, uh, tropopause fault just along the peninsula preceding the event. So that was, and that we could measure actually with the radiosons. 
So it was really the record high. So we had, this is the uh, 99th, uh, 95th, 99th percentile. So during this year, so we had the whole region of impacted by this event. I showed already the really strong increase in temperature. And just a, a couple minutes, or a couple minutes, a couple seconds on the slide. So that's the, uh, we see, um, this is from era five reanalysis, which was given really good results for, for this uh, event. So we see the patchy precipitation and this huge contrast between the West and the East Antarctica, despite that the flow was really meridional. So we see that still we have this uh, orographic enhancement of precipitation on the Western side, and it was raining during the entire event, two days of rain. So it was not just two hours, it was two days raining over Vernadsky Station, which is also confirmed with the, the radar measurements that they have there. And we see that this uh, really strong, uh, so the heating, uh, get into the Western Antarctica and then this, the, the, uh, the uh, enhanced heating due to fern in the East Antarctica and also the highlighting the differences, Era 5 and uh, the Polar Wolf. Era 5 showed actually stronger heating here while Polar Wolf also represented better probably the, the fern but it was more uh, patchy. And the, the, the radio zones, I'll just uh, switch to the next slide. So this is the red line here, comparing again to the, the mean and this, the, this, uh, the range of the, to the regular radio zones, and this is our event. So you see how much it stands out, the, the temperature increase, the humidity, and then how, much, wh how well it was represented by era five, the dash line, and here the humidity is actually is underestimated. So there is this blimp here, and then this is the layer that we are really paying attention, this 925, 900 hectopascal, where this moisture increase was. So this is the rain during uh, the seven to eight event. And there was a huge uh, melt, actually it was a record high melt over the peninsula. So we see that it was a record high surface melt extent. And when we look at the era five, the land um, product, so there was actually not only the extent that matters, but the, the amount of melt. So we see a really deep melt. So we, well, there was really a lot of melt over the, the, uh, the Northern Larsen Sea, like embayment uh, of the Larsen B shelf and in this, the Western part as well. So it was really an important event for, um, for the, the surface melt and also a reminder that that was the minimum sea ice in Antarctica in during that month that was reached in the end of February, so maybe there is a relationship also with this important uh, event. So I will uh, leave you to, to read the, the conclusions because I run out of time, and thank you very much for your attention.